And with that, I will introduce Liz Moyer with the Native Plant Society of Texas uh, to talk about getting started with native plants. Thanks, Blake. So I'm really happy to be here because yesterday our last shrub lift leaked out and I'm happy to say we did not lose one single plant in our landscape in the big trees. That's because it's 90% natives and they were, they're, they're even happier now than they normally are. So we're, we're pleased with that. So the Native Plant Society works to preserve native plants, obviously, and teach people how to use them. And the Master Gardener Association teaches about horticultural techniques and practices. So I like to think the Native Plant Society tells you what to plant, and the Master Gardeners tell you how to plant it and where to plant it. They also have a lot of good information about what to plant. Whoops. Uh, I did want to note that the Master Gardener Association has a lot going on. Um, our garden tour is coming up in October this year, so you get to see some Master Gardener's personal gardens. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, we have a lot of classes happening and speaker series and so forth, and we do have a help desk that you can call or email anytime. I do recommend that you uh, subscribe to the monthly newsletter. It's free. It's online. Uh, it's a great newsletter, one second best in the state a couple years ago. So do you know where your plants come from? Unfortunately, many of our landscapes look like this with plants from Japan, South America, China, or wherever, because that's what we see, um, that's what a lot of us grew up with, or that's what might be in the garden centers. The fact is that 96% of birds feed caterpillar to their young, and it takes six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one little group of birds. And we need those birds and they need caterpillars. So we need to think about what are we doing that's going to help, uh, help support our wildlife. Non-native plants are indigestible to wildlife. So Chinese pistache hosts nothing. It feeds nothing. The only thing it provides is cover or shelter. Whereas oaks host over 500 species of moths and butterflies, and provide cover and shelter in those wonderful acres to keep our squirrels fed. So the caterpillars and bugs and other creepy crawlies eat the native plants that they were, you know, learned to eat as part of their heritage. We have to have those in order for the birds to have creepy crawlies. But if nothing is eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And that's not the goal. We have too much garden space here to not be supporting the local ecosystem. Now, this is a map. This is a tool that many of us have used for years for picking out plants. And it's wonderful, except that it only thinks about one thing. It thinks about what's the lowest temperature. And as we learned this year, it's not, you know, it's not the lowest ever. It's just your average low. That's not the main thing that affects plants here in this area. It doesn't take into account the highs, the very highs and the very lows and the wide swings. It doesn't take into account moisture. Obviously it doesn't look at soil types, winds, altitude, and the micro uh, climates that you have within your yard. So this gives you one tiny piece of the puzzle. But there's so many pieces, it's difficult to think about them all. So the easiest thing to do is just pick native plants that grow here naturally. They're happy with our soils. They're happy in drought or flood or heat or cold or those days when it's 80 degrees in the morning and 35 at night. They're okay with that. This is a garden in Plano. Um, you might just take a note and look at that. It, this guy's, he planted his whole front yard. Very interesting um, landscape. So native landscape, native plants will use less water once they're established. They will survive and thrive on natural rainfall, but you've got to water them to get them established. They're just like any other plant. So the smaller ones, do you need to water for about a year? The mid-side one, mid ones, about two years. 
and then a great big shade tree like a pecan or a live oak or a red oak, um, three years. But after that, you can just saw. Now, this is only going to work if you adjust your sprinkler system. I've, I've talked to people who said, man, I put all native plants in my flower beds and I'm using just as much water as before. I go, well, did you change your irrigation system? Uh, <laughs> so make sure you do that. I hope you got to see uh, Ruta Den's presentation. It was excellent. So this is the secret of native plants. We are in the cross timbers of Blackland Prairie area of Texas. So you've either got soil with a lot of clay or a lot of sand. Um, and, and if you're really lucky, you have organic matter. In general, if you live in a typical suburb or a development, unless you have amended your soil, you do not have the wonderful topsoils that the Blackland Prairie provided us or that the Cross Timbers provided. You've got whatever the developer hauled in. So you still have to amend your soils to get them to be something close to what they were uh, back before the bulldozers came. But native plants will help you with that. If you look at this chart, you can see on the far left is Bermuda grass. And you can see that that root system is something less than six inches deep. I know when you're trying to pull it out of a flower bed, it sits a lot deeper, but it's really not. But look at all those native plants across there. And whether you plant those particular plants or go for something else, any native is going to have a very deep root system. Look at the purple cone flowers right there in the middle. Very common garden plant, five foot long, that root system goes. And what this does for us is that the roots themselves break up the clay as they cut through it to grow. And that provides a little highway, a little super highway for rainwater to follow down through the soils and re, uh, recharge our aquifers and our, our soil waters. And that's what enables native plants to live through drought and cold and so forth as they've got all this root that's way down there. It's also the reason that it's most frustrating to landscape with native plants because the first thing they do is grow their roots and they spend the first year growing roots. That's all they do. You go spend $10 on this beautiful plant. You go to all this effort to dig the hole and plant it and water it and absolutely nothing is happening above ground. And it's very frustrating. But hang in there. It's putting down roots. The next year, it's still going to be growing roots, but it's going to start doing stuff on top. And then the third year, it will be ready to take off. So the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, the third year it leaps. Don't get over anxious and decide you need to plant additional plants in there to fill that space. You will end up moving them. I have moved hundreds of plants for that very reason because I'm, um, I'm in a hurry. So these are, the, these are the beautiful roots. That's what we want to encourage. Every plant with a green arrow on it is available either in the nursery trade or at native plant sales in this area on a regular basis. So it's not hard to get natives anymore. So this is an elderberry uh, shrub. It, it, my husband put it in. It's outside the fence, so we don't mess with it. We don't water it. It's been there for more than two years. It doesn't get any extra water. Beautiful shrub in May 2018, and then the drought and the heat wave hit. And so in 12 weeks, it looked like this. We still did not water it because it's too dang hot to go out there and water. So we just left it alone, see what's going to happen. Four weeks later, it looked like this. So it's starting to come back. Here's the next year. See, it even made babies. So this shrub, got, it had no problem getting through the drought. It got bigger, wider, it gave more berries. It, it was just, it was wonderful. And that's what natives will do for you. And if you're looking for a tall shrub, this is about, that's a six foot fence behind it. So this one's a little over six feet tall and it's quite large. But the other thing natives do for us is they help us pre preserve our rich, Texas heritage. They're just 
Texas is an agricultural state and uh, has been for years, forever, and we're just really happy and want to participate, want to protect that. So how can you go add natives when you have an existing landscape? Well, you can start with replacing dead and dying plants with natives. Lots of opportunities right now for all that stuff that died. Um, instead of doing, planting a bunch of annuals out in the ground, put in some perennials, put in some perennial natives. And we'll, we'll look at some of those. And there's a big list of them in your handout. So while all my neighbors are out there putting in petunias or pansies or whatever it is they're putting out there, we're just sitting back and waiting for the salvia to start blooming. Please, 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 if you have a place, add some kind of understory tree. These are the shorter trees. We are really good at doing um, flowering plants and pretty good at doing shrubs and great at putting in large shade trees, but we skip that understory level. And there's a lot of birds that um, nest only at that certain height, like that go into like a Mexican plum or a red bud or something like that. So if you have a spot, please put in an understory tree. And it helps if you don't panic, just work on one area at a time. It's easy to get all excited, dig everything out, and then start looking for plants. And especially this year, that might be a little bit more of a challenge, but they're still there. There's plenty of them. Uh, but just work on one area at a time so you can kind of see how, how things are going to go. So think about it. Do you want to try to go all in? If you want to do this, I suggest you talk to your co-compliance people in your town. Um, or do you have a more traditional look? We live in Flower Mound, right on the edge of Morris Road. Uh, very traditional uh, landscape. But within that traditional landscape, it's almost all natives. What we have found is native does not mean wild. It can mean very uh, contained. And if you put in a nice flower bed and put rocks around it, put some kind of nice um, border on it, nobody's going to complain about whatever's going on inside it. So go for it. So one way to do this is to create theme gardens. This was an idea that came from our um, chapter in Guadalupe County. This gives you an opportunity to plan for year-round beauty so you can really study and think about when do things bloom and when do I, what, where do I have gaps and pick things to fill in those gaps. You can make sure that you locate plants with similar water and sun requirements together. Very often this is an issue, you know, you don't plant, say, a blackfoot daisy that needs good drainage and dry soil next to a tropical milkweed or a swamp milkweed that needs lots of water. So this gives you a chance to kind of rethink how you have selected your plants. And plant in groups or drifts, odd numbers, not in a straight row. Think about nature and how nature grows, and that'll, that'll help your um, birds and stuff to be a lot safer too. So these are the theme gardens that we're going to look at. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. You have them in your handout and the handout lists each of the plants that's in them. Um, I did switch one of the plants and we'll get to that one when we when we get to that one. But um, if you see something you really, really like, then just put a check mark or do something in your handout for it. I want to make sure you get to see them all and see the pretty pictures, but I don't want to go over time. So this, these designs were developed by the Guadalupe chapter of the Native Plant Society, and I did adjust the plants for our area. And all illustrations were done by Marla Miller. We, we appreciate them. So this is a bird and butterfly garden. Lots of people say, ooh, I want, a, I want a pollinator garden. I want a butterfly garden. So here's an easy idea of how you might do it. Um, you want to have some flaming acanthus, maybe some butterfly weed, some blue mist flower, and some coral honeysuckle. And then there's lots of different ways you can arrange it, but this is a good way to start. Remember, you can always, instead of a fence, it might be your house, it might be, you could duplicate this. These are just layouts to kind of give you an idea of what goes in front and what goes in the middle and what goes in the back. Flame acanthus is one of my favorite plants. It is so beautiful. It is a bright orange and it blooms almost all summer. Um, 
it is a magnet for hummingbirds. It's a great shrub, but it is not evergreen. It dies to the ground in the winter, but that's okay because it pops right back up and gets to be very good size very quickly. And it's a larval host to these two great little butterflies. So how cool is that? Butterfly milkweed, lots of people have seen these. These are in our yard. Um, there's a two little monarch butterfly uh, caterpillars on there. Uh, the monarchs have are here, or at least the scouts are here. So they're they're coming through now looking for milkweed. We've been amazed. They come straight to our yard and go straight to where the milkweed is, even though there's only like two leaves sticking up above the ground right now. They seem to know. So uh, this is a great thing. You, you all know the problems with monarchs and, and how much we need to support them and get more milkweed in. While the milkweed supports them in the spring, mist flower will support them in the fall. You know, they go north in the spring with uh, multiple generations. In the fall, going south, it is one generation that goes all the way through. Um, are you guys seeing these slides okay? You should be seeing blue mist flower right now. Yes, we are. Okay, good. All right. So this is both of these um, bloom. Okay, Amy wants to know about a source for milkweed. In the handouts, in the resource list, there are lists of nurseries. And I know Painted Flower Farm grows a lot of milkweed, but most of those nurseries are gonna have milkweed. Um, Miss Flower blooms, the blue Miss Flower blooms from August to about November. Greg's will start maybe as early as April this year. It's probably going to be May or June and bloom until October. Occasionally, you'll have them both blooming at the same time, um, and that's fun. But the main thing is you want, the, you want something blooming from late August all the way through to the freeze because as the monarchs go south, they really have to have a pollen source. They get hungry on that long trip. It's just that one poor little butterfly flying all the way from the northeast to Mexico. So let's give them a rest area, give them some break. This is coral honeysuckle. Um, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful vine. The one on the far left that says photo by Liz Moyer, that is ours yesterday. So you can see that it did not suffer with the um, freeze at all. You can let it go wild like that. That is with no pruning whatsoever, but you can prune it up like the one in the middle of the lamppost, you know, and you can do that with your kitchen shears. It doesn't take any time at all. It is a hummingbird magnet. I quit putting out hummingbird feeders because they're all just like all over the coral honeysuckle anyway. Okay, the pastel colors garden. You just want something pretty and and a lot of different colors. So in this one, we're going to have a Mexican plum tree, some yellow columbines, prairie verbena, and some pretty pink rock roses. So this is a Mexican plum. That one on the far left, that is ours about a week ago. Um, you can see it did not suffer from the freeze. It's very happy. It's a great little tree. This is one of those understory trees that I'm really encouraging you to plant. Um, it has nice fruit that the wildlife love, and the bees go bananas with these flowers, and you get wonderful honey from them. Um, but this is a little small tree. It's only going to grow to be 20 to 35 feet high. That is a six-foot fence behind it, and that tree is totally mature. So that gives you a pretty good idea. It's not going to get much, it's not going to get over 20 feet probably. Or you could put in a Texas red bud. This is a red bud. Again, this is ours this year. It is not, it was like a couple of weeks ago when we were out mulching. You can see all the live oak leaves on the ground, but no damage here. Um, they're only going to get to be 10 to 20 feet high. So. The Mexican plum and the red bud and these ornament, small ornamental trees, these are the trees that you plant if you have overhead lines. So if you're planting over under an overhead line, you want to plant something short, and these are the plants for you. And the red bud is the larval host of Henry's elf and was a cute little butterfly. 
Color Minds, outstanding source for color in shade or part shade. Blooms early, ours are starting to bloom right now. Very happy plant, did not suffer with the freeze. Prairie Verbena, full sun, low water user, bright purple. This is the most ripped off plant, I think, in the nursery industry right now. You go to a, to a nursery or a big box store, anywhere that's selling plants, they're probably going to have some of this. And then they're going to have these tables and tables of verbena that is dark red or orange or yellow or whatever. And if you read the label, those are annuals. They have been uh, developed from this plant, but they're no longer perennials. You're going to have to replace them every year. They are not native. In many cases, our native bees can't even see that color because the way their eyes are, they can only see certain colors. They can't even see them. Um, they're just, you know, they're pretty. And if you just want to put some in the container or whatever, that's great. But don't make it a long-term investment. If you're going to do a long-term investment, put in these. You put them in. Yeah, they're slow to get started, but this is our third year on ours, and they are magnificent. It's like a carpet out. Rock Rose. This picture is from last year, but our rock roses are starting to peak out, so we're expecting them again. They do bloom uh, in morning sun from spring to fall. They will reseed nearby, but not aggressively. Um, and they're a wonderful little plant. You do have to cut it back in the fall. It is a member of the hibiscus family, so it's really, it's just a very pretty plant, great to put around uh, near your pool or whatever. And Okay, mailbox garden. This is the one where I made a little change. If you look beyond the mailbox, you'll see they've got a red yucca sticking out. So you might want to make yourself a note. I moved the red, I just switched three and four on this layout and moved the red yucca to the back of the mailbox because I like my mailman and I don't want a red yucca sticking in his window on his way back. So this has got Zexmania, Mexican Feathergrass, the Red Yucca, and Crowberry. And make sure you do keep your approach clear because you love your mailman too. So here's the Red Yucca, beautiful plant. Ours made it through the winter. They're starting to poke up a little bloom still maybe. Um, they're going to be blooming May to October. A lot of things this year are off by about three to four weeks, but that's okay. Um, you don't have to do anything to them. You can, if you want to, at the end of the season, cut off the bloom stalk, but you don't have to. It'll fall off by itself. Coral berry. This is absolutely my favorite shrub in the whole world. It's just beautiful. Only grows to be three to four feet tall. So this is a great uh, replacement for those Indian hawthorns. Um, it's semi-deciduous, but mostly evergreen. Ours are very full and beautiful right now. Very happy. Um, they'll grow in anything from sun to part shade to full shade, and it has a leaf, a small leaf. Um, it's just not like any other shrub that you see. It, the leaf structure is very much like a maidenhair fern, but it is three to four feet tall. It's just a gorgeous little plant. The coral berries, the little berries you see there, they're small. They come up in the winter. Um, I mean, when they come up, they're like, back inside the shrub so you don't really see much of them. You don't plant this for the, I mean, you can plant it for the berries because the birds and the wildlife will eat them, but it's just a great texture to add to your garden. Now this is a Zexmania. I, I kind of tracked it last year because I'm, I'm never quite sure about this plant. You can see in early May it was blooming. In late May it was really blooming. I cut it back in July, and then look what it was doing in September. That plant is already getting ready to bloom again. So it had no, no, no damage from the freeze. You need to water it, like I said, for the first year after you plant it. It is now becoming more and more available in nurseries. Um, you, if you cut it back in January and July, then you have more bloom in, so more growth. It's a great plant, bright yellow. 
Mexican feather grass, we've all seen a lot of this. It is pretty as just one individual plant, as you see on the left, or a whole bunch of it, as you see on the right. Um, it is a bunch of grass. It can get to 24 inches high. Most of what I've seen around here is generally only about 18. But you might think about grasses as replacements on some of those shrubs. Put in a big boulder and plant some grass around. Texas Moon Garden. This one is all whites and blues. So very pretty. I'll let you decide if you want to put a statue in yours or not, uh, but you can. Um, Sinizo. This is ours that are on, around our pool. Very happy plant here. You're seeing it a lot in the um, highway medians and boulevards. Full sun, low water. Blooms when it's high humidity, just a great plant. It does need to be cut back some occasionally. Um, and then it's also a larval host of that beautiful butterfly. That's a cute little dude. Okay, mealy blue sage, one of my favorites. This is one that is cut back to the ground in February and is three feet tall by mid-May. I mean, you can just sit back and, and watch it grow. It is a beautiful, big blue bloom that attracts bees of all sorts. They just love it, um, but it is uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, it's a low water user. We don't water it. We just let it go. It blooms, as I said, from March until the freeze. You might see it marketed as Henry Dulberg. Or there's also a white version of it called the Augusta Dualberg. They were originally found growing on the Dualberg's um, graves in a remote cemetery. So that tells you how hardy this is. It's growing out there where nothing's taking care of it. Lyra leaf sage. This is a cool little ground cover. If you need a ground cover in the shade or part shade, this is a really good one. Um, it spreads quite nicely. And it's really not that hard to contain if you want to contain it. But you have these really adorable leaves that have the red veining in them. And then one day it just pops up and has these beautiful little light blue flowers. And then they go away and you've still got this beautiful foliage. So it's a, it's a great ground cover. And then blackfoot daisies. How many of you have killed a blackfoot daisy? I am guessing pretty much everybody has. I have killed probably hundreds of them. Um, that's because I never bothered to really think about where they wanted to live. Where they need to live is in a well-drained area. The one you can see outside the fence, the one on the lower right, um, that is outside our fence. It's right next to where that elderberry is. Once I started planting them there, they are just very, very happy. They get nothing except rainwater. Um, ours have already been blooming for about a week. Blackfoot daisies are a perennial, but they are a three to four year lifespan. So in our case, we have four clumps of them and every year I replace one. Um, just to try to ha always have some, and, and that gives us, gives, I'm not so disappointed when one of them reaches the end of its natural life. But it does need to be well drained. That soil outside our fence is terrible, and it slopes towards the sidewalk, towards Morris Road, um, so it's very well drained. This is the Four Season Garden. There's always, you know, we all would like to have something in our gardens blooming all the time. And it is possible to have one plant which will, I guarantee, will always be in bloom, and that's this. Um, but if you don't want to have just that, then let's look at the Four Season Garden. We have um, Possum Hall Holly, which will give us beautiful berries in the winter. The Blue Bonnets, which will be blooming in another week or two up here. Um, Autumn Sage, also known as Salvia Gregia, Chili Pekin, some fall asters, and some wonderful grasses. 
I, I don't want you to discount grasses as being a wonderful landscape opportunity. So blue bonnets, obviously, Texas state flower, we really like to plant them and grow them. Um, they can be a little bit persnickety. Each year we estimate that about 30 to 40% of the seeds produced uh, uh, come up the following year. But once you get them started, then they'll continue to spread and they'll start growing on each other exponentially. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's also um, heart, uh, host to many of our wonderful little butterflies. Look at that eastern tail blue. Okay, autumn sage, salvia gregia. It's a wonderful plant. It, it's very easy to grow. You, it's almost impossible to kill. I mean, I've never killed one, I don't think. Um, ours are all coming back from the winter. It comes in a multitude of colors now. You can get it in red, white, coral, red or white with red lips, we have one called hot lips. There's just a jillion of them. It's a wonderful perennial. It will get to be two to three feet tall. If you don't cut it back, it will become extremely woody. It'll have big, heavy uh, branches in it. I mean, branches like um, maybe an inch in diameter. Um, it grows in full sun to part shade and blooms best in full sun. If you prune it by half in midsummer, you'll get more blooms in the fall. And we should not cut this one back until late February or early March, late February to early March. Uh, there are several native insects whose larvae overwinter in the stems. So leave them in place. They don't look that bad. Everybody's yard looks bad in the winter. And, uh, but do make sure you prune them. The one in the lower right, I neglected to prune for three years and it just got to be humongous. And, and then it took me a couple of years to keep pruning it back to get it back under control. So do make sure you prune them. Um, you'll love this little plant. I mean, the highway department's planting it everywhere. So that tells you it doesn't really need any follow-up maintenance once it gets established, other than trimming. And it doesn't need to be cut in little squares. Just cut it back to the ground. We cut it back to about, we leave about an inch of stem sticking up so we know where it is. Fall aster, love my fall aster. These plants will bloom from mid-October to early November. So they are hitting right at the time that the monarchs are going south. It's a wonderful little plant. It's easy to grow. It does spread and it's easy to separate. Um, you just let it, let it grow. When it gets to be about eight or 10 inches, you cut it back a couple or three inches. Keep cutting it back about every three weeks until the 1st of August and then stop and just wait for it to bloom in October. Every time you cut it back, each one of those little stems will branch and make um, five new stems. So the more you cut it back, the more blooms you'll have. Uh, and it's, it's a great plant and it's easy to share too. It's, it spreads by rhizomes, so it's easy to dig and share. And uh, at the end of the year, you just leave it in place. When you start seeing green around the base, because it, it comes back from the base, it doesn't re-leaf out after it loses its leaves in the winter, it comes back from the base. When you see green coming up around the stems at the ground level, then just go through and cut it off. And it will come back. Chili Pekin, this is a cute little plant. This is also a nice shrub, but it's pretty short, one to three feet high, uh, but it's really cute. It is extremely hot. The berries in it are extremely hot. Very, you know, so if you want to make a um, hot sauce for somebody that you don't really like, this would be the plant to have. Um, it has cute little white blooms from April to November, and then it has berries in the winter, which the wildlife really like. So the birds will eat them and, and you don't have to. Um, and it'll make 
it'll make berries in anything from full sun to almost full shade. Uh, this is a possum haw holly. Uh, a lot of people would love to have a possum haw. I, I, we are lucky we have one. I happened to catch it at a local nursery when I was working there one spring. Uh, but the nurseries in your resource list will likely have them. Uh, check ahead and make sure that you get a female. If you don't get a female, you won't have berries. And the only way to do that is to look at the branches. Right now, there may just happen to be a few old dried up berries hanging off of it, but there may not because the birds got really hungry this winter. Uh, but you'll see the you'll see leaves coming out and you'll see at the base of those leaves little um, buds that are going to be the little flowers that will eventually make the berries. If all you see is um, leaves and nothing else, then it's probably a male. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, it's still a great plant. It's just in the winter, it's going to be bare. So this is another one of those uh, middle of the road trees. It's only going to get to be about 20 feet tall at the most. Um, it is deciduous. You prune it in the late winter to keep it under control, um, but you don't have to. You can just let it go, and it doesn't really get that big. And make sure you get the female plant. Lindheimer muley. This is one of the great bunch grasses if you need something large. So if you're looking to replace shrubs, think about this. It, it takes up the same amount of visual space. Um, but it gives you a whole different texture and a whole different look. It's a beautiful plant. <clears throat> if you want to see some, uh, the Louisville Library has uh, a big native garden in front. Well, it used to be in front of the old, it's in front of where the old library was. It's a circle. And in that circle, there's a bunch of Lindheimer muley. So you can just go see it. But even in, I mean, in the summer, you see these beautiful plumes, and then in the winter, look at that. I mean, that is a beautiful plant, summer or winter. Then in the winter, in February, you just cut it back and start it over. This is a Texas story garden. I think this is really called that because it's it's got plants, like, from different regions, and obviously it's shaped like Texas. I, I'm, I'll leave that alone. Anyway, it's a great, um, great list of plants here. You got your purple cone flower, very popular plant here. Does come in a multitude of colors and um, shapes of petals, and you don't know until they come up and then I change. <coughs> Pardon me. Flowers from April to September. If you cut it back in February in the flower, if you cut it back in July, it'll flower even more in August and September. And as I said, the colors can change. One of our members had this. Uh, we call that the tie-dye, the hippie comb flower. So you just never know. Indian blanket, these are beautiful flowers. They grow, I've had the best luck growing them from seed. Um, great, they bloom from May to August. Also great to cut flowers. They need poor soil and good drainage. So you should have lots of that. Yopon holly, very popular plant. You can find this plant anywhere. It is one of the small trees, 12 to 25 feet. Uh, it is evergreen. The birds love the berries. The cedar wax wings will just come swooping in one day and be gone. And then uh, you're also supporting this lovely little butterfly. Pale yucca, this is a different look, you know, but it would be a good replacement for some of these shrubs. Um, gives you a different look. It looks good whether it's blooming or not, different texture. Look at that. I mean, it's just a pretty plant and it's, and it's fun. Um, the blooms on these are just wonderful. They just smell great. And this deer resistant border, not a lot of us have trouble with deer, but some might. And even if you don't, the plants that are in it are all excellent. Evergreen sumac, beautiful plant, has these great white, um, blooms in the spring and then the red berries in the fall. Low water once established, another one's going to need two years probably of water and then it's done. Uh, ours is just growing out on the edge of the property, gets no attention and it's very happy. 
The Sinezo we already talked about. Golf Mealy, don't you love seeing that big pink flowery heads just waving in the wind in the fall? Um, even in the spring, they're still beautiful. So you can put some of those in. It's not just for highways. Lantana, this is another one that has been hybridized extensively. So be very careful. In, in your plant list that I gave you, if it's got the Latin name given, then that's a native, and that's what you need to be looking for on those little labels. Uh, and most nurseries will be able to give you the Latin name of their plants. So if you've got shade, we did not cover shade gardens, but uh, the Native Plant Society of Texas Attorney Forks chapter, that's the local Denton chapter, on our website has plant lists. We have them by garden type, so that's where you get your shade garden list, butterfly garden, water garden, and so forth. And then we have them by plant type, grasses, shrubs, vines, shrubs. So there's another good source for you for plant lists. So plant a native, and you'll be very happy. You'll have more time because you're doing less maintenance, but you'll have a garden that's supporting the local wildlife. You can learn more. The Native Plant Society, the Trinity Forks chapter, meets January through October on the fourth Thursday. We're meeting online right now, but we're having fantastic speakers. Um, and uh, we also have landscape certification classes, native landscape Certification classes, don't get all excited about the certification. It's a good thing, um, but it's a great class. They're easy, they're one day a piece, and they are posted currently at nipsot.org. So if y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to address those. Is so Liz, this is Amy. We, we did oh. have a couple questions in the chat box and I was gonna read those to you. Um, Cheryl had asked, do you have any suggestions for where to find the possum haw? Absolutely. Um, it, in the resource list, there is a list of nurseries. The top 14 or 15 are members of the Native Plant Society NICE program, and they are very likely to have it. The ones after that may have it. So I would call ahead and specifically make sure you ask for a female. They know you want a female, but ask. I can't and then see. we had Lillian ask, oh, sorry. I was just trying to stop screen sharing. Go ahead. Um, Lillian asked, what pollinators did the female possum haws need and how close should they be planted? We just have one lily and it blooms and produces berries every year. I think there's enough of the various hollies in the general landscapes around here that you wouldn't have to worry about that. The pollinators are moving here to there to there to there and hollies are all producing good berries so I think we're good. Okay, we had another question from Pamela. Um, she asked, do you cut back the chili pekin? You can, but I don't think there's a real need to. Pat, I, I thought I saw you were signed in. Yeah, what happens is, is they kind of die back to the ground naturally anyway. So they're kind of, uh, all you're going to be left with is a dead stick and they will go away and then you'll start your growth from the, from the base again. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, I had one more from Laura. She asked, how much mulch do you put around these when you plant? Okay. Mulch is probably one of the most important things we do here because it not only protects our plants in the summer and winter, but it feeds your soil and will help you develop better soil with more microbes and such in it. Um, we put down three to four inches of mulch in the spring. Now you need to be cautious. Do not have the mulch right up to your plants. Leave uh, an inch or two of bare soil out around the the base around the stems and on trees you need to leave three to five inches away from the trunk so that you can see the root flare. Um, 
but we put down three three to four inches in all the beds and around the trees and then in the in the fall um, you can put down you know freshen it up a little bit put maybe a couple of inches down uh, but mulch will help not only will it help keep moisture in but it also helps protect the roots from the hot 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 sun and from the cold cold winter as we learn but which um rubber mulch was okay right rubber mulch is not okay uh, rubber mulch belongs in the playground and that it's okay there i guess but here you need natural mulch it's best to get it buy it from a local source that um, is getting it from local trees and there are several um, the city of denton has a wonderful program we we use their mulch uh, as part of the dino dirt program so that's local trees it's got the same chemical balance as the soils that those trees grew in so um, i think it's always a good idea to buy locally local mulch the hardwood mulches double grind they look real nice and they'll stay put you start getting a cedar mulch they're fine but they float away all right and we had one more question come in um it was is the magenta rock rose a native the magenta rock rose um the native rock rose blooms a pretty bright pink there's also a brazilian rock rose that's very popular and it's a cute little plant and it blooms white with a deep magenta center i think so remember if it has the name of another country as part of its name it's probably not a texas native so the brazilian rock rose is not a texas native but it does grow here um and the native rock rose is generally just sold as a texas rock rose or under its scientific name pavonia and you, you'll see it lit, uh, tagged as a pavonia p-a-v-o-n-i-a -A. so it's a great plant i highly recommend it so y'all come visit the NIPSOT website, come visit some of our meetings. We'd love to have you. We'll be having a plant sale in September when Keep Louisville Beautiful has their fall trash off. Hopefully we'll all be in person by then.